Welcome to Don't Get Caught Off Guard, what managers should know before a request for leave or an accommodation is made. If anyone's having any tech issues or problems with um, either logging in or with audio, you need to contact our tech support. Please just email webinars at wagnerlawgroup.com. I'm Catherine Brustowitz, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, David Gabor. We're employment attorneys with extensive experience in advising our employer side clients on issues surrounding leave and accommodation requests that they receive from their employees. That is what we're going to be focusing on during the next 30 minutes with an emphasis on the ADA and the PWFA. We really enjoy presenting webinars and are hopeful that you will take away some concrete tips to help keep you and your organization better organized and better protected from legal claims stemming from the ADA and PWFA. Here is our agenda for our program today. We will begin with David providing an overview of what reasonable accommodations are or could be. Then I will discuss some essentials under the ADA as well as a few illustrative legal cases. Next, we will introduce the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and review some pertinent recent cases. The interactive process is truly integral to our take home messages today. So we will spend some time ensuring the process is clear for you. We then will highlight best practices for employers. So you have concrete tips that you can take home with you. And lastly, David and I like to wrap up our webinars with a top 10 list summarizing the subject matter that we've discussed throughout the webinar. So without further ado, David, would you like to delve in? Sure, thank you very much, Catherine. And hello, and I appreciate all of you joining us today for this program. Uh, before we get into the ADA accommodations, there's one thing I want you to know, and there's a big difference between the Family Medical Leave Act and the ADA. Under the Family Medical Leave Act, you have to be working for the company for at least 12 months and 1,250 hours in the last 12 months. Under the ADA, an employee's rights begin actually when they apply for a job. They don't have to be hired. They don't have to be with your company for a year. The rights under the ADA, including the rights for an accommodation, vest immediately. Um, now, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is charged as a federal agency that oversees an employee's rights and an employer's obligations under the ADA. And the judiciary is where we look at precedent from cases that have been handled, you know, to see what the courts and then the EEOC expect of employers. Um, when an employee is disabled, and Catherine's going to talk in on the next slide, I believe, about you know some of the aspects regarding who is and who is not covered under the ADA. But when an employee is disabled, they, that employee is entitled to a reasonable accommodation, and the idea is that that accommodation will help the employee be able to perform the essential functions of the job. The, the difficulty is oftentimes what is a, a reasonable accommodation. And another dis a difficulty that we'll talk about in a few minutes is that all too many managers really don't understand the accommodation process and butcher it. Um, so there are legal and ethical reasons why we should get into the interactive process to decide on a possible reasonable accommodation. From the legal side, you really don't want to get caught on the wrong side of a press release from the EEOC or a lawsuit brought because you botched it. On the ethical side, you know, it's doing the right thing. It's, you know, if an employee can have an accommodation so they can work, they can make a living, they can put food on the table, why not give them the accommodation? It really does make good sense to do it. And oh, by the way, by going through the process, you do reduce the risk of being on the wrong side of a lawsuit. Uh, 
Now, we all heard about the great resignation a few years ago, and many of our clients are still having trouble staffing positions. You handle the process right. You get an employee back to work who needs that accommodation. Coworkers will appreciate that. They will become more loyal to your company. They will see this as a good place to work, and it will pay dividends. You know, it does have that great impact on culture, and it will reduce unwanted turnover. Uh, the last thing I want to mention at this point is you should have a process in place, inform management, and set up your protocols now before an employee ever comes to you as an accommodation. So, Catherine, can you talk a bit more about the ADA? Yes, absolutely. And thank you, David. So very high level, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, is a federal civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. The ADA prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in the same way that other civil rights laws like Title VII prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, national origin, age, and religion. Now, the ADA defines a person as being disabled if they have a physical or mental impairment that significantly limits one or more major life activities, or if that person is perceived by others as having such an impairment. So, for example, a person in a wheelchair. Few examples of ADA-covered disabilities include respiratory conditions, such as asthma, hearing or visual impairments, such as deafness or blindness, various orthopedic issues, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, and pregnancy. Now that was just a short list of examples and was in no way exhaustive. If it's a close call as to whether the person is or is not disabled, it's best to err on the side of caution. In a few slides, David is going to discuss the interactive process. That's what this last bullet point on this slide alludes to. Just to key you in on what the interactive process is without encroaching into David's material later in the program, the interactive process is the process by which the employer and employee engage in meaningful communication in an effort to determine whether or not a reasonable a reasonable accommodation exists that would allow the employee to continue to meet the essential functions of their job. Now, this communication is fluid and it is organic, and that is why it needs to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Speaking of cases, David, would you like to walk us through a few case studies here? Sure, thank you, Catherine. And on this slide, we're going to talk about two cases, and I actually have a bonus third case I'll share with you. And these are examples where the employers missed the opportunity to engage in the reasonable accommodation interactive process. And because of that, they had to pay a whole lot of money and get a whole lot of bad press. And the first case was a case called Dollar General. This um, is a major company tons of tons of locations, tons of employees, and all the money in the world to properly prepare their managers. Well, in this Tennessee store, a type 1 diabetic went to her manager and said she is having difficulty controlling her blood sugar. She gets low blood sugar sugars, and she needs to have a sugary substance with her. And the boss said, no, you cannot do that. That's not our look. That's not our feel. You cannot do it. So she gets a low blood sugar. She goes to the cooler. She takes out an orange juice, drinks it, paid for it. It costs a buck 89, a buck 89. She gets fired for doing that. She goes to court. It goes to the Circuit Court of Appeals. She wins. This costs the company around $800,000. TNNY is a hotel group in New York. And they have an employee who's got a really bad knee problem and says, I can walk for 30 minutes, but then I need to sit for a little bit. She can do every part of her job if she could just sit on the stool when she's actually doing work at the front desk in the hotel, 
doing paperwork. She could do every part of her job. They won't let her have the stool. She gets fired. And that case went to court, massive damages. Third is a Walgreens in Louisiana. And an employee is working at the pharmacy and she's spotting. She goes to her boss and says, I'm having problems, I'm spotting. I need to go see my doctor. Boss says, no. She says, I've got to go. Boss says, no. She says, I've got to go. I'm spotting. He says, if you leave, we will treat you like you quit. So she left. She gets fired. And oh, by the way, the poor lady had a miscarriage. But the common thread in all three cases is what the manager should have done is gone to HR and said, this is what was asked of me. How do I handle it? By failing to do that in these three cases, and there are hundreds of others like it, the company had lost good people, got sued, lost their cases, and had a whole lot of bad press. So with that, Catherine, can you talk about the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, please? Absolutely. And thank you for walking us through those cases. So I'm going to briefly outline employers' duties under the PWFA hopefully provide some clarity on pregnant workers' rights and protections, and explain ways that employers can minimize their risk and liability under the PWFA. Covered entities are required to make a reasonable accommodation to qualified employees or applicants who have known limitations related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. Now that's the case only when it's absent in undue hardship to business. The PWFA applies to both private and public sector employers that have 15 or more employees. It also applies to federal agencies, employment agencies, and labor organizations. The PWFA provides for reasonable accommodations for qualified workers with known limitations, so physical or mental conditions that have been communicated to the employer. And those limitations are related to or affected by or arising out of pregnancy, childbirth, or related conditions. Now of note, the EEOC takes a broad view of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. In fact, physical or mental conditions can be considered PWFA limitations regardless of whether they meet the ADA's stricter definition of disability. Now, just to give you a few examples, um, a few conditions, a few of these conditions include fertility treatments, morning sickness, lactation, miscarriage, gestational diabetes, postpartum depression, anxiety, psychosis, and even frequent urination. So similar to the ADA, under the PWFA, employers are required to provide accommodations absent in undue hardship. The best way for employers to handle this is to engage in the interactive process. The employer and the employee communicate about the employee's limitations and try to determine whether there's a reasonable accommodation that enables the employee to continue to work. The employer must consider the employee's preference, but it's the employer who makes the ultimate final decision on the accommodation. But the idea is to allow the worker to continue to work while pregnant. So I wanted to go through a few cases here. The EEOC has recently brought a number of cases in which the employer has mishandled requests for accommodations. Now you'll hear that there are some striking similarities between these cases uh, with the three cases that David just went through. But these two particular ones, I just wanted to quickly address. In EEOC versus Polaris Industries, the EEOC claims that the employer's actions were illegal under the PWFA. The agency filed against Polaris after the company refused to excuse an employee's absences for pregnancy-related conditions and for medical appointments. They required her to work mandatory overtime, despite knowing that her physician had restricted her from working over 40 hours in a week during her pregnancy. In a strikingly similar situation in EEOC versus urological specialists of Oklahoma, the employee was in her final trimester of a high-risk pregnancy, 
she requested the reasonable accommodations that her doctor had suggested of sitting, taking breaks, and working part-time. Her employer refused her request and then required her to take unpaid leave and would not guarantee her breaks to pump breast milk. When the employee would not return to work without guaranteed breaks, the practice fired her. Now remember that the PWFA provides reasonable accommodations for qualified workers with known limitations due to their pregnancy. Both employers in these two illustrations were aware that the employees were pregnant. They were aware of the reasonable accommodation request and they illegally refused to grant the accommodation. Now they've been sued. Don't be like these two employers. Now, a common thread in these cases, similar to the common thread in the three cases that David discussed, is that the managers denied the employee's request for an accommodation, and they failed to report the request to human resources. At that point, the employer and employee should have engaged in the interactive process to determine whether there was a reasonable accommodation available that would have enabled the employees to perform the essential functions of their job. Now, David is about to share some tips on how you can avoid this type of legal liability. Thanks, Catherine. And thank you for sharing those illustrations on the PWFA. So the interactive process really is the same process for an ADA request for an accommodation or under the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. And the first step in the process is the employee is going to make the ask, hey, I've got this condition, I've got this situation, I need some help. They may be more specific, they may say what the accommodation is they're looking for, they may say they just need some help, they may even imply that they've got a condition that's making it hard for them to get the job done. Any of those things can should trigger going into the interactive process. And essentially what the interactive process is, it's a back and forth. The employee says, this is an accommodation that would help me. The employer listens and the employer, you know, huddles and says, can we do this? Is this reasonable? Are they asking for too much? Is this something we can do? What would the impact be to the business? And there's a back and forth. Um, during the process, the employer can ask for a medical letter, a doctor's note saying that with this accommodation, the employee can work the essential functions of the job. Now, in certain fields, it may be necessary to get some kind of certification that this employee would not be a threat to themselves, to other employees, or to the public at large, depending upon the field the person is. The effort needs to be a good faith effort. Employers sometimes approach this from a closed-minded perspective because they don't want to open the door. And if they open the door, you know, other people are going to make requests and they perceive that it's overreaching or is unduly burdensome. You know, I remember a case years ago with a person who's climbing poles for an electric company and this person had lost a leg, but was able to climb with a prosthetic device, was able to do the job, physically could do it. They wouldn't let the person do it. it ended up costing that company a lot of money. Um, so you've got to be reasonable. And the test of what's reasonable has got to be as objective as possible. Uh, two other points and make a note. The managers who receive these types of requests must not gossip because if they do gossip, they can violate privacy rights an employee has. It could be a HIPAA situation. It could make it impossible for this person to continue to work for the company. So it's real important that we guard against any kind of gossip. And let's, and let's talk about um, best practices, Catherine. Okay, thank you. The first one is consistency. Uh, the decision-making process on whether to grant an accommodation and what type of accommodation to grant, first off, the process gets centralized because consistency is the most important thing. Nothing is more important than that. Um, because if you 
give an accommodation to one person and not another person, then one person who does not get it might claim disparate treatment, unequal treatment, might claim discrimination, or it could lead to hard feelings and poor employee engagement and turnover. So you really want to be sure that it's consistent. Document the process. Um, I've been in court, the, um, the case in front of it, the judge before my case that day, major hotel chain, and they, oh, we went through the interactive process. The lawyer says, the judge says, well, where's your documentation on it? And the lawyer says, um, um, well, we, uh, we, we, there isn't any. Then the judge says, as far as I'm concerned, you never went through the process. Document it. What the ask was, what the response was, all the back and forth. When did this take place? Was it in person? Was it virtual? Who was there? Get all that information, make those records right away and save those records. It's critical you do that. Um, and then if you keep HR involved in the process, that makes a lot of sense because it's complicated. Sometimes a person comes in looking for an accommodation and they have got protection under the Americans with Disabilities Act. It might be the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. It could be the Family Medical Leave Act. It could be workers' comp. There are different laws that create different rights and protections for employees and responsibilities for employers. So the manager in whatever their trade is, is great at that job, but they're not educated on these statutes. HR has got good working knowledge and they're the asset so really, it's so important to involve HR in the process. Hey, Catherine, can you talk a bit more about how the managers should respond when the employee comes to them? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, David. Uh, so the best practices here that are outlined in this slide do focus on the role of managers and supervisors, um, as well as the importance of proper training. So untrained managers can expose the company's liability. Think back to the cases that David and I discussed. It's imperative that the front line be properly prepared in advance of a request for reasonable accommodation. That loops back to the importance of having a centralized system that David just discussed on the last slide. It's illegal to treat different employees' requests for reasonable accommodations in disparate ways. Fair and equal treatment of employees, regardless of their belonging to certain protected classes, is really crucial. When a manager is faced with the request, they should know right off the bat to loop HR into the process. They also need to know to keep the request confidential and not to gossip with colleagues about the request. You know, in addition to what David mentioned with respect to HIPAA concerns and privacy concerns, making sure that the employee who has made the request is aware of the confidential nature should put them at ease as well. Sometimes it can be a little bit uncomfortable requesting an accommodation. So just keeping the lines of communication open with the employee, but keeping it confidential and not gossiping is the right way to go. So here, just to reiterate, managers and supervisors need to be trained ahead of time so that they can properly escalate the request to human resources. It's also important to stay current as the law change as the laws change. The PWFA, which we discussed in detail earlier, came into law relatively recently. It went into effect the summer of 2023, and the EEOC issued its final regulation to carry out the law uh, this past summer. Now, with the change in the White House administration coming up. Uh, laws and employer obligations are bound to change as well. So please make sure to keep apprised of these changes and ensure that supervisors and managers are aware as well. Remember that the ADA covers those with disabilities as well as those who are regarded as disabled. If there's any uncertainty as to whether an employee is disabled, it is safest to err on the side of caution. With respect to documentation, HR should be tracking all accommodation requests to prevent potential claims of disparate treatment. This documentation can end up being exonerating if the matter ends up in litigation. And lastly, it's worth mentioning retaliation. Recall that it is illegal to retaliate against an individual 
for exercising their legal rights. Further, the anti-retaliation clause under the ADA prohibits discrimination against an individual because they opposed something unlawful under the ADA or have been involved in some type of complaint activity. This is another reason why management needs to be trained so they don't inadvertently retaliate against an employee for having requested an accommodation. So if you have ever joined me and David in any past webinars, then this top 10 list will look rather familiar. David and I always like to wrap up our webinars with a list of top 10 take-home messages from the program. So our first take-home message today is strong lines of communication between managers and human resources, as well as strong lines of communication between managers and employees. We've talked quite a bit today about the importance of managers bringing accommodation requests to HR, but the communication between managers and their direct reports is equally important. Employees appreciate transparency. Employees may not be aware of the process and really do appreciate being kept in the loop by their managers. So um, I think it's also important to note that a company should have a process in place now, not when an employee makes a complaint. There should be a policy in how the company is going to handle a request for an accommodation, uh, who is involved in the process. You know, is this someone in HR? Is it someone in legal? Is it a, the CEO of the company? You know, who's involved in the process? Set that up now before an employee makes a request for an accommodation. Once you set up that policy, then it's real important to train the managers. And the way I look at this is, if a manager knows what to do before the complaint comes in, you know, it's almost like driving a car. You, there are things you do instinctively when you drive a car. You don't think about it, but because you've been doing it for a long time, you do it. You know, an, an athlete knows what to do before the ball comes to them, and that's years of training. Managers, it, and it doesn't take years to train managers. It's a simple training that could take a half hour to an hour. They need to know what to do. They need to know that they've got to report this to HR. They, they're not going to offer their opinion on it. They're not going to gossip about it but they're going to go to HR right away. They're going to tell the employee, the employee can also go to HR and they're going to reassure the employee that it's okay. We, we will work this out. We will do our best to work this out. You're, you know, have that conversation and we'll be in a good position. Okay, Catherine, I am sorry. I think I stumbled, um, I trampled on your words a little bit, but please go ahead. <laughs> No problem. Uh, but yes, you, you did just a smidge. Uh, managers do need to immediately report the request to human resources, as David noted. And truly, not to beat a dead horse here, but this is a critical take home message. And being consistent and avoiding retaliation will help to keep your company compliant as well. And that ties into the next take home message. Leadership needs to understand which employees are covered under the ADA and PWFA, and be aware the same protections are in place for employees who are regarded as disabled too. Understanding the interactive process. Now the process itself is relatively straightforward, but most managers are focused on their day-to-day -day work, their business. Oftentimes leadership is not aware that they're obligated to engage in the interactive process. Knowing what to do is half the battle. So make sure your team is well-trained and aware of the interactive process. And with respect to the PWFA, employers should understand that one of the goals of the PWFA is to find a way for employees to continue to work while they're pregnant or experiencing pregnancy-related conditions. David? Yeah, thank you. Um, the public policy goal is to get people back to work whenever it's possible. And that put the burden on employers to help find reasonable accommodations so the employees can perform the essential functions of the job. And, you know, whenever possible, make a really good effort to find that accommodation. But I want to throw a curveball at you. 
an employee is out on leave, let's say family medical leave, and they come back to you and they say they need another two weeks before they're ready to come back to work. Nope, nope, you, you get your 12th week, that's, that's it, no more time, is a knee-jerk reaction. But is that request for two weeks actually a request for a reasonable accommodation? Uh, and the, there are courts that say that is a fair request. A second curveball. An employee is out on leave and the employer sends a note that says, you're welcome to come back when you can perform your job. And the EEOC has come down and said, that is illegal. The message should be, you're welcome to come back when you can perform the essential functions of your job with or without a reasonable accommodation. So I think that's real important to keep in mind. The next point, centralizing the process, we talked about that earlier. If you have one place where you're keeping the records, and Catherine talked about the documentation, I talked about centralizing, and you've organized that so you've got consistency, you're doing real well. Catherine, can you talk about gossip? Absolutely. So we have touched upon this one, but it's human nature to be inclined to gossip, but managers and supervisors should be trained not to do so. Uh, gossiping about employees' disabilities or requests for accommodations can, can get you in hot water. It also speaks to workplace culture and employees' trust and comfort. And David, we are coming up pretty short on time here. So would you like to just walk us through our last top 10? Sure, I'm going to do it in the form of a hypothetical. Great. Clark needs an accommodation to go to physical therapy because of some serious injuries he suffered. His appointments are every Wednesday at one o'clock between the drive to and the drive firm. He needs 90 minutes every Wednesday and is approved by and his boss is a person named Grant. However, Grant decides to go on vacation so he can do some lobster hunting. And while he's on vacation, Michael B. steps in as Clark's manager. Michael B. doesn't know about the accommodation, and he rips Clark apart for leaving on Wednesday to go to the appointment. That could create some real big problems. And, and that's been the source of litigation. That type of scenario has been the source of litigation. Make sure the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. Otherwise, you can have these kinds of problems. Let's jump to the next slide, please. That was a great hypothetical, David. Thank you. Um, Catherine and I do these programs on a regular basis because we want to help all of you avoid the traps that we described just with those five you know, case studies from real cases. They weren't make up case, made up cases. We're here to help. You can reach out to either one of us. We'd love to brainstorm. Please also let us know if there are any other topics that you want to hear about. We'll be doing a bunch of programs in early 2025 as we get a sense of what's going on in Washington. Have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Take care.